Hello, everybody. Aloha. I'm here with John. We're at the Honua Okuna Hub, where we are passing out all kinds of supplies today. There was all kinds of good stuff uh, going into today that was uh, passed out to the evacuees who are, what we're noticing today, kind of shifting their their focus of what they're what they're doing, right? Yeah, the things people need have, have changed. It was a busy day here today, but we noticed Things that were being uh, taken were more like blankets, pillows, waste baskets, um, shower heads, things that can help you kind of move into a home. And so we were kind of thinking, you know, people's needs have changed and hopefully they're getting in a situation they're getting more situated with a more permanent or at least longer term sort of arrangement, hopefully. So it was interesting, but a lot of, a lot of house stuff was given away today. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was cool. Yeah. So um, we'll have this is just closing now, and uh, we'll be reopened on Monday once again, two to six regular hours. Um, so yeah, there's still plenty of donations coming in. So you guys or evacuees can keep coming down, come back down on Monday, and now yeah, we'll hopefully be here to talk story as much time as possible and come get your supplies and all that too. So so yeah, that's a. Uh, so it's a short little hub update. We're gonna give you guys a little eruption update here also. We're not gonna drag it out too long with any kind of deep dives into theory at least. That's the plan. <laughs> Our we'll plan see. is we'll see how it goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, someone just asked about pool oil in here. What's our quick pool oil update? Oh, well, the, the update probably people are interested in is that where there were rock falls uh, through the week, spread over several days at one point, um, that created some dark plumes, brown plumes, or ashy looking plumes, and that's associated with the collapse inside Pu'u'o'o. And then the other aspect is Pu'u'o'o is the, one of our tilt meters has been recording that rise for some time now, and that's, that's still going up. Um, but probably the thing most people have heard about is those dark plumes and it indicate people see the dark cloud coming from Pu'u'u'u and they think, oh, is it erupting? Is there activity? And it's the same kind of process. Rock falls create those dust clouds. Some mornings there's a lot of steam. So um, there's stuff happening, but it's not like an emergence of new activity has happened at Pu'u'u'u. Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing convincing. You know, it's possible that if there is magma coming in down there that it could be steaming the water slightly more but it's totally inconclusive at this point. We'll look at the tilt plot here um, very soon, but first let's show you guys the Fisher 8 um, images that we have compiled for you guys. And so with the lighting here, you guys, I'm gonna flip this camera around. And let's look at the, where was it? Show you guys back over here. Here's our webcam, I webcam image from earlier tonight of Fisher 8. And Right there in the middle is our collapse pit right in there. Mm -hmm. There have been some spots back over here with some glowing spots um, that maybe John could talk about. Right, well, yeah, and uh, back around the 13th to the 15th was the last of the glow that we could see coming from this pit as it collapsed. You know, at one point there was light coming out over here when it collapsed. Later as it collapsed, we could see light coming out of this edge and that was like unmistakable glowing from lava or red hot rock as it collapsed in and lately we don't have any of that incandescence in the in the pit crater but we do see random little lights so there's one real consistent one up here on the wall there's one over here one over here and then the one down here by where the gas is coming out looks like a little candle or something at night you can kind of see the gases fluctuating and waving in the time lapse and so those little teeny lights are a little hard to explain we debate whether or not they actually exist <laughs> but if anything they're probably a little bit of glow lighting up the gases and some of those sulfur fumaroles or something like that um, so there are some weird little dancing lights but um, they're not coming from the bottom of this collapsed crater they're coming from tiny little sources somewhere around the wall and might be associated with some really hot vents. It's a little hard to say, but yeah. things we're watching. Yeah, so if, you know, if they really are hot vents, they could, it could be glowing, it could be something, you know, we're not, uh, you know, maybe it's not strong enough that we can eliminate some kind of optical issue yeah. with a camera, perhaps, you know, it's not really clear. Um, but, you know, maybe the most extreme thing it could possibly be is like a crack. Maybe like, you know, maybe this collapse area from in here is expanding outwards. And let me flip the view here to the next one. Yeah. 
really and interesting. this is the, the overhead view. Let me, let me get this in this focus a little more there. Oh, there we go. Um, this is from uh, Mick Calber's video from yesterday, Tropical Visions. And overhead view, you guys can see the, the camera is looking in is somewhere down over here looking in this direction. So this is a collapsed pit right over here. It's much longer in a direction of the camera view. You don't see how deep it is, right, compared to how wide it is in that camera view. So that view of spots is back over here. And it could be that, you know, this thing might actually be like a center of collapse pit and there could be actually cracks forming in the outside of here somewhere. And if some of those cracks, you know, if, if we see like lots of glowing spots all in a line, which you could argue maybe they are, maybe they aren't, mm -hmm. then maybe they could be, you know, a piece of a crack that's opened up, opened up again. Yeah. So that's the, you know, like, probably the, you know, let's call it the most extreme possibility. Even that doesn't show us any indication of lava coming up necessarily. There's been no steady increase in glow. Those little lights are really faint. Something where if you weren't looking at the camera, you probably couldn't see them from anywhere. Hmm. Right? Yeah, they're really, really small. The camera picks them up and, you know, they weren't there and then they appeared, got slightly brighter, but overall, they're really, really small. And, you know, it's hard to tell if the camera can see them better than us or if, if we actually could stand there and look into the vents in the night. They might be visible to the naked eye, but really, really small. And it's just interesting, you know, the, the pit started collapsing somewhere in here and expanded lengthwise over where the fissure was really long kidney shaped and there's something going on over in here it looks almost like it might have collapsed a little towards the back as well but yeah the lights are are so small there's something i entertain myself with trying to figure out where they're coming from but no real major changes in the time we're watching those so, right, right. <clears throat> so yeah um that's a uh... The Fisher 8 cam, um, by the way, is on a USGS webcam site, um, and also uh, it's listed easily on a hawaiitracker.com site as well, where there's a compilation of webcams and uh, uh, tilt links as well, if you guys want to check it, check it out there. So that's the, the two, the two uh, Fisher 8 um, photographs we're going to show you guys today. Let me go back to the tilt plots. Let's talk about the tilt next here. So looking at the tilt, let me, let me go to the USGS page first here. Looking at the tilt, we can see that over the last two days at the summit, um, there's been a net decrease in the tilt, despite these little daytime bumps that we get, and despite these little earthquake bumps, that we, spikes that we actually have. And over the last two days at the rift zone, you can see there's a slight increase in inflation, right? With no, nothing kind of quite as funny in there, right? Maybe. You don't, don't really even see those daytime signals, although there's a couple little bumps there, and there's hard, you know, it doesn't quite correspond. The scale, so you guys can tell, on this upper plot, that we start off at just below one, and we end up just above minus 0.5. Right, so that is uh, a little bit over one microradian of deflation. And on this lower plot, we're starting at minus 0.5, and we're ending up at plus 0.5, so that's a plus one microradian of deflation. This is for the last two days. Let's give you guys a scale. And then looking at the, oh, let's, we, got a, we got a cricket on here. <laughs> see a cricket. Um, so uh, both plots together, looking for the past week. And you guys can see the summit in blue was going up slightly, going down more. The rift zone was kind of flattish, going up slightly, then going up slightly more, then going up slightly less, and going up slightly more. But that's the trend of it. And on this scale, over the last week, we're basically, um, from minus one to a little bit over plus one up here. So it's a little bit over two over the last week and a little bit less than one that didn't drop at the summit over the last week or so. So let me go, let me go to the Hawaii Tracker page now, the tilt page, because here we have a nice lineup of these plots. Oh, and by the way, this is the other summit station, which is the one that was repaired after the lightning, slightly different than the other plot you guys see. Mm see on the um, USGS page um, and it doesn't quite show the daytime bumps as prominently um, but it does still show that overall deflation at a scale of about a microradian also or so so um, that's the, the summit plot looking at the two plots in the upper rift zone um, we don't see much signal here at summer camp or at the escape road, you know, um, this little drop right in here was that rain event that we had. So since then is what we're really in interested in seeing. Maybe a slight increase here at the very back, but on the, on the straight north component and nothing visible on the east component there. So um, 
zooming into the summer camp plot. You can see that was our rain event over here, and it's been maybe, maybe wiggling, but mostly flat there, and if anything, dropping here at the bottom on, the, on that other signal. So now moving down Rift Zone, looking at Mana Ulu, um, we have a lot of variation from daytime signals here, but we want to basically look at the, let's look at, for example, at the bottom of these arcs of, the, of, of these signals, the oscillation signal. So this is our rain area right here. And since then, we've have, had a fairly steady increase, which kind of parallels what we see in this plot down here at Pu'o'o, um, at least on this component. Um, that is showing in the last, what is that, two days, uh, about a two microradian, is that right? From here, from one to almost three, almost two microradian component on this, on this, uh, actually that's not two days, that's a, uh, what, since the 16th, right? So that's three days between them, I think, right? So yeah, it's six days or so, right? Mm -hmm. The last six days or a week or so, right? That's the blow up of the last plot we kind of showed. And looking at that, um, we can see that there was a similar kind of increase earlier on in the month for kind of a flat, flatter time and for a little increase as well. But the scale of this from the very bottom down here, if you look at this minus point, minus two right there, and at the very top, it's maybe two and a half or so. So on the order of four microradians increase total over the last month or so. So these are not huge amounts of, of ground tilt. Um, John and I have been arguing about how significant they are, and we'll probably do some more of that for you guys here. <laughs> um, but just kind of starting off, that's the that's what the information is showing. And looking down here at the Jonica flow plot, which is the one closest closest down here to Leilani, um, there's two components, and it's a little difficult to kind of kind of tell exactly. But the one component is rising, while the second component is kind of going away. Right. So. Um, this part of it right here, you know, um, may indicate something coming in to the area underneath the Jonica flow area. But um, John and I disagree about how convincing that is that it might actually be magma. You know, um, John is right to say that this well could be magma coming in. It could be coming in and showing itself first up here at Mana Ulu. And maybe, maybe there's some signal up here that's just kind of obscure that we can't see for some reason in these farther up stations, but it's not really clear until you're not really clear or, you know, convincing that there's even a trend at all until you get to Mana Ulu, which is the first rift zone station against the south flank. Um, we see that. So here, let's just, let's look at this. The actual increase from here might, might have began sometime around, let's call it a 14th, 15th or so, right? The increase down here maybe starts maybe the 17th or so. Mm -hmm. And increase down here might start on the 20th or so. Right? Mm -hmm. So there could be a progression there. Um, the real kicker to me is why why does a pattern not, why don't we see that farther up, right, on the rift zone? And that's just not an answer that we have right now. Um, so it seems like um, the ground is tilting there for some reason. Um, one obvious reason would be the magma. Um, but um, my personal view, and I'll give John this platform <laughs> chance as well, um, is that these signals are so small that I'm not convinced they actually are magma moving through. And if it is magma moving through, is it is, is that a, such a small amount that maybe it's not significant? Um, so um, I, that's, I just kind of... I've kind of um, just come come to that personal point of view just because um, I feel like there's a whole bunch of things that can actually um, cause tilt to change within that one two micro radian range. Um, that's not magma. For example, we're seeing at Mana Ulu, like you know, the, the huge variation of the daytime and nighttime from the heat and oscillations. A huge signal, right? That's kind of whatever else we're looking at is embedded within there. I mean, point that around. Can I just give an example? This is the most extreme case in my favor. It's not what, what the pool or station looks like right but for example like the range of increase from down here to up here is half a micro radian or so and in one day we're rising and falling a full micro radian up and down right so that's that's kind of what I'm pointing out as far as the scale being so small that it's not very convincing to me because I can see some other effects clearly the daytime heat is producing a much larger variation then I see the variation total increasing through here. Now, these are two different separate signals. So, you know, they could both be happening, actually. You know, I'm not saying that it's not. I'm just saying I'm not convinced of that. So, um, 
scale. Mm. When you look at it in this in this scale, it's not not as obvious because these little variations are not nearly as big, right? But you know, who's to say that the amount of increase from here to here is so much more insignificant than the one from here to here? So mm. that's kind of where I'm coming from there. Mm. So. Um, you know, um, without knowing exactly, you know, what, what other, other things could be causing the ground to tilt besides magma, you know, we can kind of speculate it could be any kind of movement of fluid to the ground. Magma is the, the one that's the densest and, you know, pushes the most and, you know, would probably show the biggest signal. But, you know, I don't, I personally, you know, could imagine that some change in the groundwater flow, you know, um, or in the gas flow through the area of cracks from the, from the rift. Water flow could be, you know, from all these big rainstorms we've had from the hurricane, right? You know, we, it, it rained how many feet over here, like two weeks ago, and that water is going to move down towards the ocean, you know, through the rocks. So mm -hmm. I just can't discount that, you know, that wouldn't form some kind of deformation wave, you know, that's very, very minor, but the tilt meter might actually pick up. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. I'm just not convinced, even though it might be a magma signal in there, that it actually is a magma signal. Mm. But fortunately, we have John to <laughs> keep us on track, you know, for the possibility that it actually may well be, may well be magma. I'm going to turn the camera to you, John, I'll, here. I'll play devil's advocate again. So I, I think it's probably magma. Um, so, um, the, the, the game is, you know, we have to pick out the signal from the noise. And when the eruption paused and everything stopped, you know, everybody hopefully witnessed, Phil and I for days have been going through every line of evidence looking for what's actually happened. Is this actually indicating anything? We've had a few red herrings, um, but mostly the volcano's been flatline with very tiny changes. So we're scrutinizing the tiny, tiny changes. And now one of those tiny changes is starting to appear to me like that's our signal. Uh, we have this subtle inflation happening at, at Pu'o'o, and there's even indications that maybe that change is also happening, Mauna'ulu and the other areas. But the one to watch throughout this is if that change in tilt is real. First off, you know, USGS noticed it immediately and said, well, this could be an indication of recharging of the rift. And you notice the language they're saying there. Uh, we have to be methodical one step at a time with this process of reasoning. And yes, that could be a sign of magma refilling the rift. And so they noticed that right away. If that's the case, then the sensor to watch is down rift of Pu'u'u'u, because we already knew the lava could get as far as Pu'u'u'u for 35 years. The question is, can it still come all the way the rest of the way down into the lower east rift zone? So the sensor to watch is JKA or JOKA, the Jonica Flow Tilt Meter and Seismograph, because they're one of our only instruments between Pu'u'u'u and the lower rift. And so I've been watching that one very closely. And lo and behold, now that trend has changed and we're seeing an uptick. We're starting to see that line is evened out, flattened out, flattened out, gotten flatter, 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 until now it's rising again. So can we look at this one again? Yeah. And so this one is the one. This is the Jonica Flow Station. It's in Waukeleopuna Forest Reserve. And so it's basically flat, yeah, but a slight trend towards deflation and definitely the, the tangential tilt was steady on down on down. But about in here is when I was noticing, hey, it looks like that line is smoothing out, flattening out. And I was waiting to watch it rise, but instead this one went down. This one ultimately flattened out and transitioned to now we can see the trend is up. If we make our best fit curve, that trend is up where it used to be down. And you know, we have two lines of evidence here with every tilt seg signal, there are two types and the, the mathematics and all of this is, it can be uh, uh, a bit for my brain to process. But if we average these two things, you see we have one going up, one going down. So those kind of cancel each other out, which is why Phil's not convinced about this signal. But one thing I want to suggest to you is even if we're not getting a lot of support for how much it's inflating, the magnitude is not extreme, the average of these two curves is still indicating that it's not deflating anymore. It's flatter than it was in the past. So that is still the type of change that we would expect 
if there were magma beginning to recharge the rift and if it's able to venture on past Pu'u'u'u. So I think that these are the subtle signals of magma reoccupying a system that we don't know as well anymore after all the changes, that big pulse of magma that came through our eruption, the 6.9 earthquake and other aftershocks. So I think there is something significant to these very small changes in tilt, especially with the sort of coordinated way that they they're appear to be propagating down the rift one station after another. Um, but I grant you, you know, this is science. My feeling is this is magma. Um, and we'll have to wait and see if that continues to be more pronounced as a signal, if we can distinguish that signal out of the noise better over time, or if not. Um, but I think that might is the first clues of what we're seeing, is that if we're looking for the magma, the signal in the noise, I think we found it in the East Rift. So possibly, a couple of things. You know, first, first to help you finish flushing out your thought, um, tell us why we wouldn't see the signal at the summit, and oh. how is this possible that we could have this pattern of just the... Right. Well, there's two ways to look at that. And one is, we are kind of seeing signals at the summit. It's, on a couple occasions, inflated slightly before deflating again slightly. And I grant you, these are small changes. So that's the similar kind of process we would see if magma was coming up to the summit and then draining out of the summit and heading into the East Rift. So I think that would be a natural curve if it was still going to the summit and then on through. The other thing is though, this signal, Pu'u'o'o, is the first one to change and it's in the middle of the rift. And so that could be, oh. Mana'ulu changes too, huh? Oh, uh, Mana'ulu changes too? It's just a lot noisier and hard to see. Noisier, but this is the first one that USGS confirms is changing signal. They haven't mentioned Mana'ulu yet. Yeah, because they don't show this one publicly, right? But this is that really, if you look at the bottom of this curve, mm. it follows pretty much exactly the same path as this one. Okay. Well, um, I don't know what In either this... case, it doesn't change your point. Yeah, uh, they're further down in the rift, but so that change happening independent of the summit, if that's what's going on, could indicate that magma is able to bypass the summit and head into the rift, which is one of the possibilities that we can't rule out in the beginning. So I remember at the town meeting, I actually asked uh, um, Tina, uh, scientists in charge, if, if the rift began inflating, showing inflation first before the summit, would that indicate deep rift supply or bypassing the summit? And she kind of scratched her set head and said, well, maybe, because it would be pretty unique in any case to see the rift inflating before the summit. So once again, unless these signals become more pronounced to convince others, then we just have a hint of that indication of the refilling of the rift. But the way this is all playing out, especially propagating down now to the JKA sensor, I think that's a significant sign that we need to keep watching. Yeah, yeah, we're going to plug us. We're going to keep watching no matter what. Hey guys, don't worry. <laughs> you know? yep. um, yeah, so um, that's back to our kind of original model. Um, discussion about can magma come in to the rift zone with bypassing the summit hopefully not um or not and you know um and i you know i still i'm not convinced that it can you know until i see it actually happen and you know but it could you know these instruments have only been on the ground for 50 years or so you know and they've only been of this quality for less than that 30 years even less than that you know so um it's hard, hard to really say that, you know, whatever we see is going to be the first time we actually see this data for this kind of event, right. no matter what. So and we'll have, we to, have, we'll have to figure it out. And we have a volcano now, too. The, the whole volcano is in a different state at the moment. We're all aware of that. So maybe something about all of this massive shift in activity collapsing at the summit, maybe that changed some kind of configuration and it's flowing into the rift in a way it didn't before. I'm not too sure. But I think backing up a step, I don't think we necessarily need to be considering bypassing the summit because we do have these inflection changes in the signal at the summit over time slightly up and slightly down and that might be related 
to small changes in the amount of magma that's in the summit as it propagates into the rift. Just right. a thought. Yeah. But yeah. again, we're we're yeah. dealing with very possible, small yeah. signs. And I told John earlier, you know, if the scale was a little <laughs> different, I would totally believe it. But you know, the fact that it's zero to one, zero to minus one, right. is what gives me a lot of doubt. You know, because very small scale. Got to emphasize that for everybody. So we are having our academic debate, our argument about this. We're still working together. Don't worry. <laughs> but we are dealing with a very small scale. That's why it's a debate. If it was a larger scale, there would be less question, and we would agree on things more quickly. But we're not getting those really clear answers, so we have to keep watching. We have to keep talking about it and analyzing it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's, the more we discuss different ideas, is probably the more inconclusive everything actually is, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, one small point I wanted to make is just uh, um, for those who are a little more math inclined, is you it's mm -hmm. you can't just exactly average these as vectors. Yeah. Okay. So you actually got to take the square and a square and take the square root of both, which means okay. that it's not actually doesn't actually work out in the flat. It means it's moving in a different direction than that, right? So it's not a consistent direction. Maybe is the easiest way to put it simply, mm -hmm. rather than it averages to flat. Which basically, you know, you just, you know, maybe to take another simple step, it makes it an inconsistent signal mm. um, to what you would expect from if, you know, like if there was a gigantic, like when magma first came through the area, let's put it that way, you know, we, we would have seen a consistent signal probably both on both lines spiking up, you know, I forget what the scale was at that point, you know, 100, 200, something like that, micro radius. Mm -hmm. Not that I would expect to see that, that kind of scale again, you know, now since we're not cracking the rock open from scratch again, mm -hmm. but you know, I would expect to see, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 micro radians, you know, somewhere in that range if magma is really pushing its way back in with any amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, um, my, you know, that's a much bigger threshold, of course, you know, um, but it doesn't mean that there is, that we shouldn't be looking at these small signals and trying to, trying to interpret them. I just think we gotta be really, really, really careful when we do that to not take it too far because Whatever we think we know about this is at a small scale, basically. So let me show you. Let's let's kind of keep moving through. We're gonna try to make this on a shorter end if we can. We kind of went down a tilt hole already. So um, here is our earthquakes for the day, and of these, uh, marked in blue is the most notable one that happened um, this morning. At was it this morning? No, yesterday morning. No, this morning. This morning, at two in the morning. Here it was a 3.7 on the south flank at a six and a half kilometer depth. So that's our typical south flank earthquake. It's gonna be likely to group right into that aftershock, so the 6.9. And that's true of all these over here as well. We have our summit adjustment earthquake still happening in there. Looks like there's, hard to say if they're all stuck on each other. Looks like there were three. <laughs> looks like there is three right in there. It looks like we have only one Pahala earthquake today. Let's see if that's a that's a deep one. Yeah, that's one of our deep ones. That's a 1.8 at 32, so we dropped off slightly. We have a couple of earthquakes up here, which I'm sure we're gonna get asked about, so I might as well talk yeah. about them already now. Where'd they go? These ones over here, which are, this is the Kauiki fault system between Mauna Loa and Kilauea. How do you say that fault again? Kauiki? Kauiki, okay. I, I believe the name of that I believe one. That's, I believe that's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll get corrected if I'm not. In any okay. case, <laughs> that's the boundary between Kilauea and Mauna Loa. So after Kilauea kind of adjusts, Mauna Loa has a chance to adjust against it. And that's the boundary that reaches the surface here. It actually goes underneath, Kilo, underneath Kilauea, kind of down and off in that direction to the south. And Kilauea kind of sits on top of that. So it's an inter interesting boundary between the two volcanoes. It's not a magma boundary. It's a structural boundary between the flanks of the volcano. Um, there is one shallow earthquake up here to summit of Mauna Loa, but it's not a cluster. There's one over here as well by Popakuloa. Um, same thing, you know, one earthquake here and there, you know, even if there was like three in an area in one day, you know, it could be one event basically releasing energy. But what yeah. about we have had several in about that same area over more like a week or more? Would that be anything indicative? You know, let's, let's switch it to seven days and see what it shows us. So yeah, there's a whole cluster right there. A few more. And a little bit slow response time on the device today. But yeah, so there's a little cluster right there. Yeah, a little bit. And what's interesting about that cluster, so let's see, right here, let's let's zoom in. So these are the only ones in the map. Okay, there they 
they are. These are the only ones in the map. So there's six of them. And the reason I do it that way is because then you can look at this list over here on the left mm -hmm. and get all the ones all kind of uh, profile, right? So you can see that these ones are at negative 0.4. So real shallow. That's a, uh, this is this is above sea level, right? So um, zero is sea level. So this means it's actually oh. underground. I see. But it's uh, within the mountain. And that one's very close. That one is just below sea level. Okay, three. These are all fairly, at least a couple ones over here a little deeper. This is actually only like 0 0.8 even listed on here because I put it on all earthquakes, right? Mm -hmm. And the largest ones, one of these is a 3.0 and a 2.5, yeah. So that is definitely some kind of, you know, adjustment of the rock in our area. But the question is, could it be magma? No, it's not because it's not coming from deep enough in a clustering pattern in a short enough time hmm. to be called a seismic swarm. Hmm. So um, doesn't mean the ground doesn't adjust, right? You know, I mean, the ground adjusts all the time and adjusts, it's clearly adjusting in this particular area right now, mm -hmm. but not because of magma coming in underneath it, is what I would say, right? Because you would see a pattern of, you know, like we saw at Leilani, when there was no question of like, oh, what's going on? It was, you know, the map was a giant, like, you know, looked like someone mm -hmm. shot it with a shotgun. It was, dots all over the place so this is not the same thing mm -hmm. right so that is the earthquake report there um what else have we got to discuss today let's see we talked about the earthquakes the tilt we showed you guys the webcam um and well we don't see any glow from the hub no glow so from the hub, yeah if, if the little dancing lights are out there we'll try and see them on the webcam but there's not a lot to see anywhere right now so that should all be taken as a good sign for everyone who's trying to not be stressed out about the volcano every night um, things are always changing but everything we can look at is only changing in very small ways at a time and so we have to wait and see if these things are gonna add up to anything over time um, to stop for that yeah that's, I think that's a good, good way for that yeah so we'll, we'll wrap it up here and you know we'll uh, give you guys more updates as, uh, as they're warranted you know I've been kind of dropping back on the schedule I think it's just kind of part of the pattern I've been trying to work on my app a bit to get you guys out an update on the app and you know we got other social duties calling us as well you know we're trying to work you know work work here with the hub and um, we know you guys are discussing the boat ramp and all that, but you know, I don't think, feel like it's my particular place to jump into that necessarily. So I'm just gonna stay out of that, you know. Um, John might feel the same way. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. Ask us science questions. It's more the comfort zone for, <laughs> for folks like me. Yeah. Uh, when we get to kick it back, we do a live with him, then we'll, uh, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll use that as a forum for that. But for now, we're gonna keep it science for today. And with that, I'm ready to sign off. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sounds good. All right, guys. Stay classy, Puna.